Hey guys, welcome to Hip Huge History. Bam, baby! That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about 1787, the Constitution, and us knowing the words so we can talk about it. We're banging out the Sixth Amendment for you in this edition, guys, so sit back, get ready to grow your brain. Let's look at the words, let's chop it up, and see if we can't walk away a little bit smarter than when we press play. Giddy up for the learning, here it comes. So let's start with the words. Let's read them, right? Maestro, music please. Bam. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously asserted by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the accusation, to be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. So one of the silly ways that I kind of help kids remember the basic concept um, is to kind of put their, their six up there, touch their invisible watch, and at least get to the concept of time. And of course, in the beginning, the accused shall right, have the right to a speedy and public trial. We have that speedy part in there. Um, Barker versus Wingo is the Supreme Court case way back in 1972. Yay for 72, what a great year to be born. But in 1972, the court defined speedy trial as not an absolute term, but basically putting a time frame of about a year before we can start investigating whether that right has been violated. Um, now, if it has been violated, there could be numerous reasons. It could be the defendant's fault, there could be you know, some kind of natural emergency or something like that. But in 73, Strunk versus the United States said if the court does find that the speedy trial has been been, um, violated, that the prosecution's been dragging its feet, maybe it doesn't have enough evidence, maybe it's trying to, you know, draw out the calendar, and uh, that right's been violated, then any conviction gets overturned, and any indictment gets squashed. So that's a pretty, pretty absolute right, if you can prove um, that it's not your fault. Now, you also have that public part in there, and the public part is not absolute either. Um, in Shepard versus Maxwell, 1966, the Supreme Court basically stated that it's preferential to have a public trial. That's what we're talking about. We should have public trials, but there could be, you know, circumstances where maybe the government has a has a legitimate interest in maybe national security, or maybe the defendant has a, a has a interest in, you know, getting a fair trial, and that outweighs the idea of having a public trial. But generally speaking, Speaking, we have public trials and for the most part we have televised trials and some states have some different rules about um, what can be a televised trial but there you go speedy and public trial let's look at the next part by an impartial jury in basically the state where the crime was committed. So there's a few things about, about jury rules. And first, you want to make sure you understand what selective incorporation is. We've talked about this in previous lectures. But it's the idea that you can take the 14th Amendment, no state shall deny its citizens equal protection and due process, right? If we're taking away your life, your liberty, or your property, you get due process. That's in the Fifth Amendment, right? But that only applies to the federal government. So um, as the Supreme Court kind of evolved judicial review, starting with like Gitlow versus New York in 1925, I believe, they started selectively incorporating some of the Bill of Rights amendments to the states. So the Sixth Amendment is got some stuff that's been selectively incorporated. We'll talk about attorney stuff in, in a few minutes here. But when it comes to jury rules, a lot of it's not been selectively incorporated. There's some kind of like broad rules but states still generally get to determine kind of how juries um, are put together. So, for instance, on a federal level, you have the number 12, but some states have as low as number 6 when it comes to how many people sit on a jury. Um, also, on a federal level, it has to be a unanimous decision. If you're charged with a federal crime, you have to have every 12 juror say that you're guilty to convict you. Um, if you don't get 12 to say that you're not guilty, then it's a hung jury. It's got to be unanimous. But some states, they have uh, rules where you don't have to have unanimous decisions. You could have a 4-2 decision or something like that, and the Supreme Court has let that stand. 
Now, um, in terms of uh, what else do we have to talk about? Like impartiality, it says impartial jury, right? We have a process that's been developed through kind of judicial law that is called voir dire, which is basically this process when the jury is getting put together that the prosecution and the defense lawyer have a chance to kind of quiz each juror to make sure they're not prejudiced against their client or they are prejudiced against their client. So for instance, if you're a prosecutor, um, you don't want maybe a peace act on some type of trial where a peace activist is being charged with a federal crime because obviously they're going to be prejudiced towards the peace activist. So this is supposed to get that impartial jury. Now there's also kind of rules about basically making sure that you have like a cross selection of people. So if you can prove that there's some systematic exclusion of a certain group and that that's giving you an unfair trial, that has been selectively incorporated. So there are those types of rules in place. But there you go, it's got to be where the crime was committed and again, you, there's flexible rules here, so if everybody in the town thinks that you're uh, you know, a puppy killer and uh, they all scream puppy killer every time you put your head out the window, you might request a different location and the judge might grant that, so there are cases where you can have you know, trials not where the crime has been committed, but you get the general idea. Alright, let's take a look at the next part. Bang, 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 bang! Lord of bang, bang, bang! To be informed about the nature and the cause of the accusation. So this is basically to make sure that you're getting that due process by having the charges very specific, very specific to the law for two reasons. You know, number one, so you know what you're charged with. There's no vagueness in there. You're being charged with being very bad, bad, you're very bad. It's not going to cut it. So it's got to be a statue. It's got to be some type of criminal law. And then secondly, you want to make sure that um, you, you kind of clear up that double jeopardy scenario. If you're going to be able to claim double jeopardy that you can't charge me with the same crime twice, you want to make sure you know what you're charged with. So that's pretty straightforward. So you have to be informed about the nature and the cause of the accusation. You got that? Good. Good for you. Let's keep going. To be confronted to the witnesses against him. So this is called the confrontation clause. And it, a lot of stuff develops out of common law, but um, over across the pond where they have the tay and such, they have this kind of hearsay clause that it's not allowable to bring into court what I heard somebody say about you. And that is secured in Amendment 6 with the Confrontation Clause, that I have to be able to confront the person accusing me of this crime or making witness testimony in this crime. There are a couple of exceptions. One of them is kind of a, a dying declaration. So certainly um, you can't confront a dead person. And if they're on the dying bed and they make the video and they, you know, Johnny did it, he shot me that can be put into evidence. There's also kind of an evidence confrontation clause, which means that if there's gonna be like DNA presented or something like that, you get to cross-examine the DNA. It's like magic. No, you can't do that. So you get to kind of cross-examine whoever the scientist is, of course, who did the, you know, the testing. So you can make sure that you can ask questions about validity and such like that. There's only a couple more. Hang on, here we go. To have compulsory process for attaining witnesses in your defense. So this is basically your ability to name witnesses, name people that you want to be put up on the stand, whether they're hostile to you or friendly to you. So, you know, if you want Mr. Jones to testify and Mr. Jones is like, I'm busy, I'm bowling, I don't want to go. Now, Mr. Jones, you're going. So that's the compulsory part. You can make them have to come. And of course, this is to give you a fair trial. It makes perfect sense. All right, the biggest part's the end. So hold on, here we go. And they have the assistance of counsel in his defense. This is your right to an attorney. Of course, that makes perfect sense. You should have somebody to be able to defend you. But nowhere in there does it say Technically, that if you can't afford one, that you get one. So here we go. This is selective incorporation. First judicial review. So the Supreme Court in 1932 in Powell v. Alabama, very famous Supreme Court case, the court said that because of the Fifth Amendment, because there's a due process clause, go watch that video if you haven't, that we can't deny you your life, your liberty, your property without due process, that if somebody is up for capital punishment, you're going to take away your life. 
and you can't afford a lawyer, so you have to defend yourself, you're not getting due process. So therefore, the state, the government, we the people, will give you that lawyer at no cost to you. And then 1938, the Supreme Court extends that to all felonies. So they decide that the Fifth Amendment gives them the right, because of the due process clause, to kind of expand the Sixth Amendment. Now, where does it get interesting? And it gets interesting, 1963, I hope that's right. Gideon versus Wainwright, where Florida puts Gideon in jail by you know, basically convicting him and he has no defense because he has to defend himself and he's indigent. It's, a, it's a, I believe, a felony burglary charge, but he can't afford a lawyer, so he goes in on his own and it's like the little guy against the giant and he gets squashed like a bug. So then he goes to prison and he reads law books and he kind of goes to the Supreme Court writing his own letter and basically the Supreme Court hears his case and he says, and this is really important, that because of the 14th Amendment, because no state shall deny its citizens due process, that we're going to take the Fifth Amendment and apply it to you, Florida. And hence, Alabama, Alaska, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Florida, Georgia, why? I don't know, Illinois, and now we can't stop you. you get the idea? So there you go, guys. There's the Sixth Amendment for you. If you can understand the Sixth Amendment and all its kind of rotating pieces, and you can understand the concept of selective incorporation, I bet that they didn't know about that in 1787, then you got it going on. So make sure if you haven't subscribed, you subscribe. That would be really nice to do. You can click my face, click my face. All good for you, and now you click my hand. You click my hand, and you go to the Constitution for Dummy series. Look, click, click, click my hand. All right, I'm done. I'm done. We're Touch and Go's Energy Flows. We'll see you next time. Next time it comes. Next time.